Okay, let's go ahead and get started. We'll uh, continue our study with Acts, chapter 26. I see Steve uh, and um, Matthew Piper on here saying hello to everybody. Everybody says hello to you guys. And so, uh, like I said, uh, when it comes to Sunday school or Bible study, I do try to bring my phone in case people ask questions. I can hopefully try to see them. If I don't see it live, I definitely look at it after afterwards and I will answer the questions then. So if you guys are ever at home and you're watching online, um, obviously I'm not going to watch it while I'm giving the message, but if it's Sunday school or Bible study, I will um, try to look at it um, as we're going along. So let's go ahead and, and open with a word of prayer and we'll continue in Acts 26. Father God, we we come to you humbly just thanking you for this time of study that we have and thanking you for the word that we have to study, knowing that we can count on it as truth. And so, Father, just um, may, the, may the Holy Spirit guide us and direct us as we, as we look at this, that we might have uh, a closer understanding of you and your word as we, as we do look at this. We pray for uh, the service to follow pray for those who can't be with us and this is all prayed in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Okay, Acts chapter 26. We were talking in verse 23 about how Paul had uh, made the statement uh, in verses 22 and 23 that the scriptures had uh, predicted and said, meaning the prophets and Moses, that Christ would suffer uh, and that he should be the, the that he should rise from the dead. So basically, that the Old Testament predicted um, that the Messiah would die and rise again. And, and so, those who want to um, argue against a mid-Acts dispensational viewpoint will will throw verses like that at you. And you, you've got to be ready to answer the question, um, because as from a mid-Acts position, we don't teach that the idea of of the death. Of Christ and the resurrection was a mystery. That's not what the mystery is that was revealed to Paul. The Old Testament did teach that Christ would suffer, that he would rise again. The mystery, um, where we talk about mid-Acts dispensationalism, is the fact that, that God was going to save the Gentiles apart from the nation of Israel. That's where the mystery comes involved. That was never predicted in the Old Testament scriptures. And so that the fact that the Gentiles would be saved based upon the finished work of Christ and all of that is, is again, that's where the mystery comes into play. And so there's this straw man argument that is used um, by those who want to say mid-Acts dispensational and is wrong, and they'll use verses like this. And so uh, it's important to understand that, uh, again, that the Old Testament did, did prophesy, did predict that the uh, Messiah would uh, uh, be cut off. And we looked at uh, a number of the verses um, from, uh, from the Old Testament. Last week we looked at Psalm 22. We looked at Isaiah 53. And, and we, um, we even talked about how Jesus, before he died, said specifically uh, when he was talking to the 12 apostles that they were going to go into Jerusalem and all the things that were written of the Son of Man would be accomplished, that he would die and rise again. So we see before it happened that Jesus said that it was said in the Old Testament. And, and so we talked about those verses and then we talked about the fact that Genesis chapter 22 is another good um, set of passages that you can look at when it comes to the death of Christ and the resurrection. Um, and I've told many a people, I'm not big on types in script, scripture. And when I say I'm not big on it, I'm not, I'm not saying I don't believe that the scripture uses types. But I think like a lot of things, man has a tendency to um, take things too far. And I think there are types in scripture. And I think Genesis 22, as we see the events unfolding with um, Abraham and Isaac, that there is a type there as it relates to the father and, um, and Christ being his only begotten son. And so I do believe in types, and there are those who, who do an excellent job of teaching on the different types of Christ and doing the different types in Scripture. Again, I think that when the Bible is obvious about the types, 
I'm more than willing to go there. It's whenever we start getting a little bit extended on that that I begin to just say, well, maybe, maybe not, and I'll move on to something else. So that's just my approach. But look at Genesis chapter 22. And, and again, I do think that um, there, is, there is the um, situation that's actually going on. Uh, I think we talked about it a little bit um, over the last couple of weeks that uh, there is oftentimes in Scripture the immediate situation, but there is ramifications that echo uh, beyond the immediate time. And I think that Genesis 22 is one of those situations because it speaks of um, Abraham's belief in a resurrection. And, and as we read this, I, I think that personally, I, I think that that's, that's, that's quite obvious. And so Genesis chapter 22, we'll, we'll pick up um, in verse, verse 1. And it, and it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abra Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thy only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into a land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell of thee, uh, tell thee of. And then again, um, that is going to be um, the mountain uh, Mount Moriah is the mountain where the temple is built um, that David later conquers from the Jebusites. And the temple will end up being built there. Verse 3, And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass. Now, what's interesting here is, don't you sometimes want to get the blanks filled in? Fill in the blanks there. I mean, between verse 2 and verse 3, we see that Abraham is told, Take your son and go offer him as a burnt sacrifice. And you don't see anything other than next Abraham rises up early in the morning. Wouldn't you like to wonder what Abraham was thinking at the moment? Mm -hmm. You know, what, what, how am I going to explain this to Sarah? You know, what is, what is this? I mean, I can just imagine Abraham was a real person. He's going to go through emotions. He's going to go through things. Again, I think the story here teaches us that Abraham was confident that either it wasn't going to happen, or even if he did, Isaac did die, that Isaac would be resurrected. But still, at that moment, uh, you're being told, take your son and I want you to go sacrifice him to me. Um, that is, that's a heavy, heavy statement. But here the scriptures um, tell us what Abraham does, which I think, because we look at Hebrews 11, and what does Hebrews 11 do? It, it, Oh, what's the word I want to look here? It, it, it props up Abraham's response to what God tells him to do. Um, sometimes what God tells us to do in his word, um, it's easy for us to just, well, I don't want to look at those verses. Um, and sometimes listening to the word of God is a difficult thing to do. Um, but I think the lesson that's being learned here is Abraham's response to this situation is, is an important thing. Val, did you have your hand up? Okay. So in verse 3, Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and clove the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And so again, um, this isn't the place that was just around the corner. This is... Um, likely a three-day or so journey that that uh, Abraham had to take. In other words, there was a specific location in which this was going to take place. And Abraham, verse 5, said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. Uh, and so again, as we look at Hebrews, um, um, it tells us that, that Abraham understood as we're going to look at, that he had promises that were unfulfilled. And so here we see in this statement that Abraham um, makes the statement that we're going to leave and we are going to come back. Um, you know, oftentimes you see um, 
reenacts reenactments or movies and it's almost like he's hiding the fact because he doesn't know what's going to transpire again I, I wouldn't suggest that abraham understood completely how things were going to transpire um, but i don't i don't think that at this point that abraham really had too much doubt because he had the promises of god tim just curious <coughs> Because you said we will, uh, we will come back. You think that may have been to uh, not alert the other two men who were with him that you know that might try and stop him from offering up Isaac, or did he know uh, you know that somehow God uh, would not allow that to happen? Well, let's go to Hebrews eleven. And, and I think that there are more things than, than meets the eye in this situation. I, I, I think that, yes, I think that Abraham knew um, that they would both come back. But at the same time, how well he understood that, I'm not sure. But Hebrews 11 does make it, uh, make it apparent that, um, uh, that he understood um, that that, Abra, uh, that Isaac was going to still be alive. Uh, look at uh, Hebrews eleven seventeen. By faith Abraham, when he was tried, this is talking about Genesis 22, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises, talking about the promises of Genesis 17, which we'll look at in a few minutes, offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That's from Genesis 17. Well, Genesis 22 is after Genesis 17, right? So if Genesis 17 is in that you have these promises of the seed, and it hasn't happened yet, and Genesis 22 comes along and says, go, go kill him, what Hebrews is telling us is that he understood those promises. And we know that's what it's saying. Verse 19, accounting that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. And so here we see in, in Hebrews 11 that Abraham, this says accounted. In other words, Abraham, the word of God tells us that Abraham did think, it, it did come across his mind that God was able to raise up Isaac because God had made promises, which look at, Genesis 17, verse uh, 19. If you, as you turn there, in verse 18, Abraham um, pleads for um, Ishmael's sake before God. And God's response in verse 19 is, And God said, Sarah, thy wife, shall bear thee a son indeed. And thou shalt shall call his name Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his seed after him. And, and so we see that there's this, this covenant that's going to take place with, Ish, uh, not with Ishmael, with, with Isaac. Well, at the point of Genesis 22, that hadn't happened yet. Look at verse 21 of this Genesis 17. He says, But my covenant will I establish with Isaac, which Sarah, which Sarah shall bear unto thee at this, this set time in the next year. And so there is this promise that's unfulfilled um, at, at Genesis, the point of Genesis 22. And Hebrews 11 makes it clear that Abraham, understanding that he had the promises, understood that God was able to raise up Isaac. And so that's why he's this... Hebrews chapter 11 is the, the heroes of the faith chapter. And, it's, and that's why it's attributed to, to Abraham, his faith. And so when we're looking at Genesis 22, and he says that we are going to go up and we're going to come back, uh, I think that is there a little bit of the fact that he's not going to go telling, you know, uh, people on a need-to-know basis? I'm sure there was a level of this need-to-know basis. But at the same time, Hebrews 11, I think, makes it clear that, that he, did, he did understand that, there, um, that God was able to raise him up and that God was a God who kept his promises. Any questions or comments on that?
back to Genesis 22, verse 6. It said, Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac, his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together. And Isaac spoke unto Abraham his father and said, My father. And he said, Here am I, here am I, son. And he said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Um, so we get a little insight here. So as much as Abraham um, had the, uh, at least an understanding of what God could or would do, he doesn't share it with Isaac. He doesn't say, you know, son, here's the deal. God said to go do this, you know, but I believe that he'll raise you from the dead. He doesn't say that to him, apparently. Um, and so Isaac is left left wondering. But it's how does Isaac handle the situation? I mean, not like most children. I mean, anybody had trouble getting your children tough to get them to do chores around the house? Let alone to lay on this so I can kill you and, and offer you up to God? Um, I'd love to have more of that story, too, filled in how that worked out. Um, but... Uh, Abraham, verse 8, says, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. And, and again, here is where we get into the immediate sense and the greater sense of what Scripture is talking about. What was the words of John, John the Baptist whenever he saw the Lord Jesus? And he's talking to his, his, John's <coughs> disciples. What does he say to them about the Lord? What does he say? He says, there is the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sins of the world. Um, you know, I think that obviously John was a prophet, but, but the scriptures foretold that the Messiah was going to come and he was going to be that sacrifice. And what was the sacrifice for sins for, for Jews? It was the Lamb, the perfect spotless Lamb of, of God. And so here we're seeing this um, really for the first time used in that sense. Verse 9, And they came to the place which God had told him of, and Abraham built an altar there, and laid the wood in order, and bound Isaac his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And I think we spoke a little bit uh, last week on the, you know, the, the Muslims believe that where they have the Dome of the Rock, there is that protruding rock that that's, that's comes out of the floor, that they believe that is the place in which that Abraham offered Isaac. They believe that that is, that is the altar. And, and really, the, most people misunderstand, the Dome of the Rock itself isn't a mosque. The Dome of the Rock is actually a building that's built um, as, as a centerpiece of this, where they believe this moment take place. On the grounds there on the Temple Mount is a mosque. But the Dome of the Rock is not actually a mosque. And so, that's where they believe this happened. Jews believe that that uh, happened in this place too. So uh, again, as I told you, uh, I think that the Temple Mount was actually the Roman fortress and the actual temple is where the Bible says, which was the city of David, which they found is actually south of the Temple Mount. So, uh, but uh, that is uh, what the traditional belief is that where the Dome of the Rock is, is where this event takes place. And they came to that place, and Abraham built the altar and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar uh, upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing that thou hast not withheld thy son, thy only son, from me. And, and to me, I guess, what I think about when I read this is, is the, the thought within um, the circle of Judaism that recognized this I mean, momentous event. And um, 
here God is is um, again I, I can't think of the right word word here. He's not exalting um, Abraham, um, but he's he's lifting him up. He's praising him. Thank you. That's the word I'm thinking of. Praising him. He's praising him for this action. But yet they they don't believe that God Himself would do that very thing. That God would 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 kill His only begotten Son. And and to me, I think that. God would never call man to do something, um, whether it's a sacrifice of any sort, that he himself wouldn't do. And so, to me, I just think of, think of that aspect, the character of God, um, whenever I see, the, see this verse here. Pastor? Yeah. I was just thinking, um, the angel of the Lord, and why didn't God call down himself uh, to do that and I think it's because it's the incarnate uh, Christ who speaks here and so God himself isn't doing the speaking so he has the angel uh, to do that because of the reverence then to, to God giving his, his only begotten son to, to die on the cross sure so, yeah yeah, I think that there's a lot of uh, cool aspects about this, but I, I think you're right. Um, again, we often make too much of things, like I talked about with types, but on the same side, we often don't make enough of things. And this being, like what Tim is talking here, being one example of that, of taking the time to, to look at how God interacts with man, why he does things the way he does. Yeah, Beth. Um. You know, your, your comment earlier, and this kind of goes back to what you just said just now, um, when you, we were on verse, I guess, two, and you were saying, you know, you would have liked to have known what went on, you know, mm -hmm. uh, it kind of had me thinking, and I was looking back here, and I'm kind of wondering, you know, in my own mind, I was thinking, God builds that faith in us, when he wants us to do something, he prepares us, mm -hmm. and so we know that he must have prepared um, Abraham um, and in that verse that first word God did tempt Abraham and said to him Abraham and he said behold here I am um, I was like that word tempt is also is prove he yeah. doesn't tempt but um, a couple verses above that where he plants that grove in Beersheba that's where he got the wood to put it you know for the fire and you think that was 20 years earlier so does that mean he was proving him over the course of those that 20 years to prepare him for this very moment sure using the same wood that he had him build a, a grove to or plant a grove i should say sure uh yeah i mean we again i mean we think of the immediate the here and now we we have the luxury today of the completed word of god i mean Sometimes I don't think we count the, the blessing that we have in that sense. But like you said, there, there are times when God would say something to these people. And yes, we think to ourselves, oh man, if, to hear God speak to me. Um, well, when God was speaking at that time, you might go 20 years with one piece of information. And that's your piece of information for a while. Then you get a little bit more later and a little bit more later. And so... Again, we have the luxury today of having the completed Word of God. Many of these, these guys didn't, so, which is why I think that they were um, praised for their faith. So, uh, But, uh, yeah, you were talking about verse, if you were wondering, um, in verse 34 of, of chapter 21, um, it, it appears as though whenever you examine all this, that there's probably 20... Uh, 20 years between verse 34 of right, chapter 21. 33 is where he planted yeah, the grove. Yeah. Right. So there's t probably 20 years between verses 33 and 34 until chapter 22, verse 1, uh, when you break this down. So. All right. Verse, uh, verse 11. So the angel of the Lord um, um, calls out to him. In verse 12, he says, Lay not thine hand, for I know that you... Um, will not uh, withheld thy son, thy only son, from me. <coughs> Verse 13. Uh, and Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him 
a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him, offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And, you know, you ever, again, I, I think, and this is, this is just a, a casual thought I share with you guys. Um, we know that, that Scripture says that every single jot and tittle had to be fulfilled, right? We, we talked about that a couple years ago what a jot and a tittle is and how every single one of them had to be fulfilled and when a prophet spoke something um, it had to be fulfilled otherwise that prophet was no no longer considered a prophet of God and so you know we see here that this ram is provided and before that um, Abraham told, tells his son that, that the sacrifice would be provided by God you know and so it makes you wonder at least it makes me wonder um, you know did, did Abraham have prior knowledge? I don't think that's the case. I don't think he had prior knowledge because then it wouldn't have been faith. Uh, and so then the question is beg, beg, if you really start thinking deep into this, does God provide the, this ram, the sacrifice, because um, Abraham, being a prophet, said that he would? Because obviously he wouldn't have told Abraham that he was going to do it, because then again it wouldn't be faith. And so I don't know if you're following my thought process here. Yeah. But also I don't think... I don't know because Abraham said God will provide himself a lamb and he provided a ram um, which we know it wasn't time for the lamb yet right mm -hmm. but so he provided a sacrifice but he didn't just say True. he will provide a sacrifice he said yeah. he will provide a lamb so that's a it good is point. a very future pro prophecy that hasn't happened yet yeah it's a good point also uh, Hebrews said that Abraham said you know God can raise Isaac from the dead so he, that signifies he didn't know. Um, well, that's what I was just saying, right. is that he didn't know, yeah. We know that he didn't know. And so the question I was hypothesizing was, so does God fulfill the ram because of something that Abraham said? Because a prophet has to be found true. And so that's why but I think Valerie's point is true, that whenever Abraham says that God's going to provide, he actually said a lamb, not a ram. So um, I think that that's, that's a good point uh, on that situation. So... Uh, I was just reading in uh, my scope field and it said the angel of the Lord act actually is the, the pre-incarnate Christ. Uh, a lot of people uh, would suggest that and I think that sometimes we see the angel of the Lord um, and we, we can speculate that it is the pre-incarnate Christ and then there are times in which it might suggest that it's not and so um, this one here again many would suggest that it is is the pre-incarnate christ so um, but we know this where did it come from came from heaven sound came from heaven so that and we know who's talking here is notice what it says whenever whenever this angel says um he said says that you have not withheld thy son thine only son from me so again that would indicate that it is coming from from god himself Another thing that brought out here is that um, you're called to, to worship the angel of the Lord, and that's something you don't do with any other angel, uh, right? But but this angel, right? Exactly, exactly. And so in verse 13, he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, him was a ram caught in the thicket by his his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And Abraham, verse 14, called the name of that place Jehovah-Jireh. And here we get introduced into one of the names of God. As it is said to this day in the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. And so again, like I said, we have this, um, this Jehovah-Jireh. In other words, the Lord shall provide is, is the actual name is what Jehovah-Jireh means. So, and again, I promised my wife one of these days we would do, the we will do the, the names of God. Um, so, verse 15, And the angel Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time and said, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thy only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, 
And in multiplying, I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore. And thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. And again, I think that as you as you examine these you can clearly see these reference to your only begot, your only son. And then we see in Jesus the only begotten of the Father whenever Jesus is baptized and the, and the Holy Spirit um, descends like a dove upon him and said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Um, this is a call as a reminder um, that he is the Lamb of God, the one who is going to have to die. And why does he have to die? Is it because it's a fun thing to do? No, he has to die because he's the sacrifice. And so if he's the sacrifice, that means he has to die. And if he is God, that means he has to resurrect. And so we can see Paul can clearly say that the scriptures do teach that the Messiah has to die. When you compare Isaiah 53 and Psalm 22 to these, to these um, uh, passages here and this understanding, um, it's very apparent that the... Um, Old Testament teaches this. But again, we have the luxury of hindsight. Uh, and so I appreciate the fact that I have that luxury of hindsight. Man today seems to think, oh, how did the Jews, how could they be so dumb? How could they be so ignorant in the wilderness? You know, they see God, you know, leading them by fire uh, at night in a cloud by day. And they immediately go and they, and they build a, a golden calf or, you know, they have the word of God. I think, that the, I think that what we see in Scripture is the chances are uh, most of us wouldn't have done much different. We like to think that we would have. Um, but I'm sure glad that I'm not put in that position. I, I am sure glad that I'm not. And so here we see this, this blessing that's going to happen um, to Abraham. And he does. He becomes Abraham. His name means basically father of many nations. So, Tim often wondered about this um, uh, the reference to your only son mm -hmm. you know, obviously it wasn't uh, Abraham's only son sure uh, he so. had Ishmael yeah yeah and, and I think that again um, God is going to bless Ishmael when we first started reading this uh, Genesis um, uh, we, we talked about how God or Abraham in, in Gen, Genesis 17 um, he um, I think it was verse 18 Genesis 17 18 he pleads for Ishmael to God he pleads for Ishmael's account um, for uh, to God and God I does bless Ishmael he does bless him um, but whenever God starts dealing with the nation of Israel who is he not dealing with all the other nations. The only way they get dealt with is through who? Nations. Which comes through who? Isaac. And so in, in, the, in the eyes of God, um, that he is the only begotten of, of Abraham. He is the one because he's, not, he's going to bless Ishmael. He's going, he, whenever, um, whenever his mom heads out into the, into the wilderness and, and leaves because God tells Abraham, send her on her way, don't worry, I'll take care of them. Um, I think part of that is because of his 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 promise to bless Abraham. But in this, in, in in reality, the fact of the matter is is that God is only dealing with this certain line, and that line is going to be through um, through Isaac. Um, and so Ishmael was already rejected to be the seed. Why? Because God had said that the blessing, that the promises that were made to Abraham, was going to come through Sarah. And how many kids did Sarah have? One. So, yes, you were going to say something? Well, <clears throat> I was just thinking Ishmael was certainly something that Satan was trying to mess up the line of Christ with, you would think. But also, I have a question. Um, I know we talked about this mount being probably the place that Christ was crucified as well, and so it would be very close to where Abraham planted that grove in it. You know, and Isaac carrying his wood just like Christ carried his cross. 
I guess I'm wondering, I wonder if Christ's cross could have come from that same grove. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, there's a lot of things that we're going to have a long time to go to ask questions about, that's for sure. And there's a lot of in interesting questions. I don't know about you guys, but I grew up, anybody else get taught this? This was, I wasn't raised in a Christian home. And so uh, we did get picked up uh, for a while uh, by a bus that went around taking us to a local Baptist church. But I wasn't raised in a Christian home. And so, but I remember, I don't remember where I learned it, but I was taught the fact that that um, Christ was crucified on a dogwood tree. Anybody ever hear that? Yeah. And that was the reason why the dogwood never grows very large anymore is because it, God cursed it because it was the tree in which was used to crucify the Lord. Something tells me that's not true, um, partly because it's not in Scripture. But as far as what what he was crucified on, um, I mean, the Romans are, are going to take something that's close and local. Um, they're going to take whatever they can get there. And, and let's face it, in many parts of Israel, um, this is one of the things that you understand. Jesus, whenever it talks about him, people talk about him being a carpenter. He probably wasn't a carpenter in the sense like we think of with working with wood. Because guess what was very scarce in Nazareth? What? Wood. wood. Guess what was very common? Stone. And so the word there actually, tecton, doesn't mean a carpenter. It actually means somebody who's working with his hands. And so in lots of areas within what we think of Israel, wood is very scarce. And so um, Romans are going to take whatever wood they can get. But that's going to be one of the, a, a good question to, to, to ask. So, you know, also... So then, I mean, just thinking through uh, your only son and, and the parallels mm -hmm. to Christ then, uh, I mean, there is more evidence that Christ was here just for the nation of Israel mm -hmm. while he was on earth up until the, the time of his crucifixion because, uh, you know, if, if uh, Abraham's only son was, was Isaac, then who was for the, the nation of Israel, then that kind of uh, supports the argument. That it's a good point. I don't know that I ever really considered it that way, but I think that's a, uh, that's a good point when you draw the parallels. And let me repeat it to see if I'm understanding your, your thought. Uh, when you consider the parallels between um, Isaac and Christ being the only son, and so Isaac obviously not the only physical son of Abraham, but the son in which God is dealing with through Sarah and Abraham together, that when you consider that parallel, it shows that with Christ, that Christ, as the Gospels say, uh, and Paul, he came to his own and his own received of not. So therefore, even that statement em emphasizes even more that Christ came only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. you said it much better well, I had time to process what you were saying. And so, uh, again, I had never thought of that. And I think that's a very good point. I think that's a very good point. So. I also, there's so many good things in here, but like in verse 8, my son God will provide himself a lamb for burnt offering. I mean, I, I feel like it's saying he will provide himself, mm -hmm. at, you know, which is what he did. And um, then I saw a note here, the Hebrew supposedly, and I don't have the Hebrew in front of me, but it says, instead of a lamb, it says the lamb. And I was like, wow, that's pretty, himself the lamb. Yeah, in my notes here, Bollinger's notes, um, his, his says that a lamb should be uh, the lamb. So I'm not sure. Yeah, New King James says the lamb. Does it? Yeah. Does it say the lamb? Okay, yeah. I forgot all the Hebrew I never learned, so... Well, and knowing that he only provided a ram here, that yeah. makes it more like he yeah. provide himself the lamb, you know? Sure. Yeah. And there is there is a lot of, of really good information or things to consider here in, in this chapter 22. Um, uh, like I said, we talked about how um, this pressing that Christ went through um, in the Garden of Gethsemane and what that means, how it means an olive press. Nothing that Christ did or God does is an, a, an, ex, you know, an accident. And, and people seem to think that, you know, again, we, and this is one of the things that's sad. People are you know, confused today. They think that, 
that God is, is, is working today and he's going to react to the things that we do. God is not reactionary. God acts and man rejects. And, and so God, whenever he, when he created things and he put things in motion, he doesn't have to react to the things. He knew the end from the beginning. And so um, you can see all that even in, in these, these cases here. And so um, a, lot of, a lot of good stuff here, like I said. So going back to Acts 26. And so, yes, Paul can rightly say that the Old Testament spoke of the sufferings of Christ and that he should uh, rise from the dead. Be the first that should rise from the dead and should show light, verse 23, unto the people and unto the Gentiles. Um, I'm sure um, Festus and, and you could also point out the fact that Agrippa, um, if you if you really look at his heritage, can be considered a Gentile as well. But Festus most certainly was was a Gentile. And again, here he is, and you got Paul making this assertion. Which, by the way, what did Paul just do? It, what did Paul just give in verse verse twenty three? The death and resurrection of Christ. He just gave the gospel. You know, in Acts 26, like I said, we're 25 years into Paul's ministry. At this point, he has already written most of the books of, uh, that, he is that he is he's going to write. And so here, what does he do? He preaches that Jesus, that he died and that he rose again. And so he's ultimately giving the gospel. Because remember that what we understand from Ephesians 1.13, that when you hear the word of truth and that you believe it, that you are sealed with the Holy Spirit. The idea is, keep in mind, at this point in time, it is true, the dispensational truth of today, understand that, that, if, that um, if you believe the gospel, you're saved, apart from works. That's true at this point. And so as Paul gives this, let's not take away from the fact that Paul really just gave the gospel. Now, it's unfortunate what's going to end up happening here is because Festus is going to interject and cut him off, which is, which is unfortunate, but... He does get this out, and what's what does he say that 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 um, he was going to Christ was going to be a light to the Gentiles? And here's Festus's response because, you know, again, I mean, I'm sure that there's probably a level of Festus saying, "Well, wait a minute, why do you think that I need to be enlightened by some Jew?" And that's probably what he's thinking. And so, and we see that uh, his response, and again. Um, what does is, what is scripture say? We're about out of time. Um, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1 regarding regarding the cross. 1 Corinthians 1. Look at verse 18. 1 Corinthians 1, 18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved is the power of God. Look at verse 23. It says, But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. And we see over and over in Paul's ministry that when he goes, it's whenever he preaches the cross. Because, you know, whenever we say preaching the cross, we're not saying only the death. Because why would we preach Jesus if all there was to it was the death? I mean, the reason why the death matters is because of the life afterwards. So the preaching of the cross is not just the death. Uh, the preaching of the cross is that he died for our sins and he rose again for our justification. That's encompassed in the idea of preaching the cross. And so whenever Paul is preaching preaching this, he how many times, whenever he preaches the cross, this idea that one, that you have to have somebody die to make you righteous, and what's the first response by most people? Wait a minute, you're saying I'm a bad person? I give to charity. And, and all these other things that they say. You, what do you mean somebody had to die to make me worthy? If God doesn't want me in heaven, then I don't want him either. And these are the things that people say. This is the approach that people have. This is why the preaching of the cross 
Um, it's to them that perish foolishness. To the, to the Jews, it's a stumbling block. Why? Well, it's a stumbling block to them because they're the ones who crucified their Messiah. And to the Greek, it's foolishness. What do you mean? I mean, the Greek was bent on wisdom. we got to cut it short there. Um, and we'll continue um, next week. Any other comments or questions? Okay. All right. Good study, guys.